All right, it is time to talk about sampling techniques. So I'm going to demo these in class, but I'm just going to go over the terms now so that you have a basic grounding before we get to class. There are three common uses of the term sampling. The first is converting an analog waveform to digital audio via an analog to digital converter. The second is recording individual notes and playing those on a keyboard with the notes coming from an instrument or voice. The third is borrowing of a segment of musical material to be used in a new piece. We're going to focus on number two because it's the primary way to reproduce an acoustic instrument sound in a DAW when you don't actually have that instrument in front of you. It lets you create new and interesting sounds using audio files for use as instruments. There are lots of applications for sound effect design for film and games that it opens up, and it's pretty fun. So first things first, you need to record some audio that you'd like to use as an instrument or download something from Freesound. It can be musical, it doesn't have to be, it can be random noises. It should be individual notes, chords, or events, but not musical phrases. You can use some things like scales or harp glissandi, uh, but you want to avoid complex musical materials like melodic or rhythmic figures, because you're just going to have to cut those down anyway. And it's really annoying for people who are working with your samples. It becomes really difficult to avoid zero crossings and fading. You know, if you need to use that stuff, save it for loops. Your recordings should be as high quality as possible, minimum 44.1K, without extraneous noise and cropped, so there's not a lot of extra blank space on either side of the audio. If there's a lot of extra blank space, your samples are going to get really, really out of sync. You don't want blank space, especially at the front. Most importantly, you need to know the pitch of each sample file and include it in the file name. Either when you're recording, make sure you have a chromatic tuner out, or in post, run it through a tuner and get the exact pitch. Then include that in the file. So toy piano c4 dot wave ideally if you're looking to create an instrument you'll want to record every note using different dynamics and different playing techniques and then label the files accordingly so trumpet harmon mute pianissimo b flat 5 dot wave once you have all your files recorded you will need to organize them in folders as long as you organize them logically and most importantly as long as your sampler knows where to find the files save a copy in your project session no one wants to have to deal with missing files so the most basic technique is what's called key mapping where you're associating a sample with a specific key or a range of keys in the sampler generally it's going to be around uh, based on the same one as the pitch of the sample that you recorded. The root key is the key associated with playing back the sample with no transposition. It should be the same as the pitch of the sample, although sometimes you might have to transpose up or down an octave to get it to fit on your keyboard or deal with some other issue in the DAW uh, that it tries to play outside of the range. The key range, also called the key zone or the key group or key region, depending on your program, is the range of keys other than the root key that will trigger the sample playback and transpose it to match the pitch of the key played. They're specified using a low key and high key parameter in just about every program. Usually they are also graphically displayed on a virtual keyboard as well. Classically, the transposition is done by changing the speed of the sample. Faster results in higher pitch, slower results in lower pitch. So if you play an octave above the root key, it's playing twice as fast. This is especially why you want to crop out all silence, especially at the beginning, so that there's no delay that gets longer and longer the lower in pitch you transpose it. So here's a picture of a basic sampler setting setup. 
I have my basic uh, two samples, Sitar 2, which has a low key of C4 and a high key of D sharp 4 and a root key of C4. Then I've got Sitar 5, which has a low key of E4, a high key of G4, and a root key of E4. You can see those both on the keyboard as uh, key zones, and you can see those in the menus below. So there are problems with key mapping. The biggest one is that you can get maybe a minor third worth of transpositions away from the root key before it starts to sound awkward and fake. So speed-based transpositions, eh, they're, they're only going to go so far. And especially when you're playing chords, because if you play, say, a chord that's using a key zone that's spanned out over an octave, you're going to get some pretty, pretty nasty drift out of sync when your higher keys finish first and your lower keys take longer to finish. It's possible to use arpeggios to avoid this, but it's not a great solution. Also, you're not going to have any changes to dynamics. What you recorded and dropped in the sampler is what's going to play when you hit a key. So the solution to this is what's called multi-sampling. Multi-sampling is very similar to basic key mapping, but you need more samples. Typically, you want what's called chromatic sampling, where you have a one-to-one -one ratio of sample file to key, so that you have every possible note for the instrument recorded as a separate file. It takes more hard drive space and more RAM to play, but on modern computers, this is not an issue. Again, just make sure that every file has its pitch in its name. It makes this much easier to work with. Uh, this is extremely common for high-end libraries and especially for keyboard instruments. An alternative is to record one sample for every couple of keys. Um, again, I don't recommend going beyond four chromatic notes or a minor third. It's more convincing as a transposition, but it doesn't hog as many resources. But I still find it to be kind of fake. So here's a photo showing a chromatic sampling layout. I have a toy piano starting with toy piano C4 and going to toy piano C5. One sample per key going all the way up. Uh, you will note, however, that I took the root key down an octave for every note. It was just because this particular sampler uh, that felt extremely high when I was playing it back on my keyboard. Now, one problem, though, is that this still doesn't deal with the lack of only one dynamic level. For that, we need what's called velocity switching, where we use the velocity of the incoming MIDI note to control which key range is played, and we do that by adding an additional key range above the previous stack of samples. So we have key ranges that are going vertically lower towards the bottom. They are going to be a lower velocity and higher. They're going to be higher velocity. And you can have any number of these. It's very common to have three or more. At that point, in addition to having to map out the low and high key settings, you have to also edit the low and high velocity settings for every sample. Otherwise, it won't work. You'll only get whatever is properly set, and everything else will be quiet. In addition to dynamics, though, velocity switching is really common for changing the articulation of notes uh, or for altering timbre by adding filters or effects to different velocity layers. The downside is that you have to make a set of samples for every note at every dynamic level, uh, with obvious exceptions for things that only have one dynamic level, like a toy piano. And there's one other major problem, which is the attack articulation. It gets a little boring if you have the same sample playing every time, no matter what the note is. There's no variance. There's not a humanizing factor. It's going to be the same thing. Sample, 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 sample. Oh, look, I changed the velocity, but it's still the same articulation at this velocity layer. The solution to that is what's called round robin sampling. We're using multiple samples stacked on top of each other at each key and velocity point 
and they are randomly selected when their stack is triggered. It's a huge, huge improvement in terms of quality and believability in terms of the performance, but it comes at the expense of a much, much larger file size. Now, I don't have a picture of a round robin layout, but I can show you here is different velocity layers. So Sitar 2 and 5 are up at the top, and those are using higher velocities from uh, MIDI 64 to 127. And then 6, 7, and 8 are lower velocities, and those are using uh, MIDI velocities 0 through 63. You'll also notice that they have different spans. You can have different uh, key ranges for different velocity layers. They don't have to be exactly matched up. Next question when you're creating your samples is, what happens when you hold the finger down on the key? Are you emulating something that has a sustain phase uh, going back to the envelopes? Is it an ADSR or an AD? Is it something like bowed strings, winds, brass, that you need that sustain? If so, you're going to have to create a loop region inside the sample. Every sampler will let you do this in different ways, but what you're going to do is create a loop. And that loop is going to repeat, usually forward, occasionally forward and backward, uh, between the two loop points. Or are you doing something like percussion or keyboard instruments or non-tremoloed plucked strings or sound effects where you're just going to have a one shot? You can hit the key, you can leave your finger down on the key, it just plays all the way through and then does not go and do anything else. So one shot is the default in almost every sampler with looping as an option that you have to turn on. And each sampler is going to be different, so we'll look at how to do this in class. But the big thing to make sure of when you're looping is to set loop points at a zero crossing to avoid any pops. So you want to make sure that your loop start and your loop end are right on the center line in the waveform display, that there's nothing above that or below that's hitting the loop start or end. Otherwise, there will be clicks, and that is not good. But what if you want multiple articulations to get something that's more articulate and believable? Well, the better sample libraries like East West, UVI, and VSL all use key switching. Uh, these are MIDI messages that change the set of samples played to allow different articulations across the different velocity layers. The way that works is you hit a MIDI key that's out of range of the instrument, or in some cases use a MIDI CC message, and that will select the articulation set to be played. And that articulation change comes before the next note. So, for example, if I'm playing a guitar sample library, and I start out with a normal pick, and then I want to change my next note to become a tremolo. What I have to do is I have to play the pick note, play the key that will change to the tremolo, and then play the tremolo. I have to make sure that I play the key switch note before the note that it applies to. Otherwise, it will not work. And then the next note in the piece will have the articulation applied to it, but I'll miss a note. Downside of key switching and creating key switch libraries is that they are massive. Um, on my desktop, my East West install is over a terabyte and a half just for that, and it is nowhere near complete. It is selected libraries only. So be aware of that. But here's a look at uh, the East West interface, and it shows the key switching, and it shows the playable keys. So the playable keys are the normal uh, black and white keys uh, down in the keyboard range. Uh, this is for the solo cello, and it goes through the entire cello range. Then the blued out keys below that on the keyboard to the left are the key switches. So if I hit one of those key switches, it will change the articulation that I'm using when I'm playing in notes that the cello can actually play in. So doing that, it allows me to switch between different articulations. I can get a much, much more convincing 
uh, set of performances either by playing it or programming the MIDI in directly. It's much better than just having one articulation and no key switching. So let's talk about software formats and conventions really quick. Uh, there's a couple things to be aware of just in terms of the nomenclature. The sampler patch is the stored sample and key velocity zone information with any modica modifications you've made to those. The sample library is a collection of multiple usually related patches. So things like a brass library, a harp library, a percussion library, a guitar library. You're going to have multiple types of sample patches in there. It might be different instruments. You might have, you know, vintage, 3 PF pickup, Les Paul, followed by, uh, you know, Squire, <laughs> bad strings. But all of those are related under the guitar category. Each library has its own unique format, so .ewi, .multi, .ufs, etc. Uh, they are not interchangeable. You have one library that works with one program and another that works with another one, and never the two shall interleave. But some will use AIF or WAV files, which you can switch between different programs, especially if you're designing your own samples. Uh, keep in mind, these are all software based. These are not hardware. Another one that's kind of interesting is the sound font. Uh, it's the .sf2 format. This is the default for Muse score. It's a hybrid format that's something between wavetable synthesis and sampling. It results in really small file size and it sounds better than MIDI, but it's worse than an actual sample library. On the hardware side, we have samplers, sample players, and romplers. Samplers were the classic keyboard that had an attached mic or a mic in that would record audio, set it to a root key, and automatically transpose it across the keyboard. Sample players are hardware devices where the samples are factory loaded and are usually unchangeable. But you just plug a MIDI keyboard into it and you use whatever menu options you have and hey, you can sound like a violin and then you can sound like a pan flute, and then you can sound like a French horn. The other one that was pretty common, especially in the 90s uh, and early 2000s, was a rompler. So these used ROM or read-only memory based uh, sample player modules. You could also buy new ROM cards for the better ones and swap the sounds out, but you could not record your own sounds. They were really popular with singer-songwriters and people who were doing arranging work, and thankfully, most of these have died now. They were generally pretty terrible and would have kind of really stereotype things like bossa nova sounds and, you know, Peruvian pan flute music sounds, and you'd have to buy new ROM cards for everything else, and you could only have one ROM card in them at once. And generally, I always found the menus to be awful. But there are a couple that have survived in software modules. So software romplers are typically software sample players that have a fixed set of waveforms, and you can never edit those. They might have like a basic volume or filter, and that's it. So in class, we're going to be looking at a number of different samplers and how to use them. In Ableton, you have two major ones, simpler and sampler. And we can also use those in audio racks for some really, really, really interesting stuff. In Logic, you have Auto Sampler, EXS24, which is thankfully being depreciated and going out. And you have the new and significantly better sampler device. Reaper in and of itself does not have a sampler, but there is TXW16X, which is a separate VST that you can download and can be used in Logic or Ableton as well. There's also Resamplematic 5000, uh, which if you have Repack installed, you can install the MPL Various and MPL RS5K Manager packages to add that to Reaper. So for now, play around with your preferred DAWs sampler and come ready to class with questions and we will look at how to create some really crazy sounds with samples.